Today's talk is going to be uh, delivered by Bhupati Srinivasan, who is a freelance communication designer, graphic designer, design educator. He's also a visiting uh, lecturer or professor at uh, uh, National Institute of Fashion Technology, Chennai. So uh, he got into design, uh, you know, uh, basically quite late in his career. Before getting into design, he was actually a uh, gra uh, software uh, engineer. He graduated in engineering computer science from NIT Trichy in 2002. And then he worked in telecom for uh, nearly six years in protocol stack development. And But his passion was always towards the arts, uh, towards design. So in 2008, he switched his career to graphic design. And then he enrolled himself in uh, National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad. And then once he graduated, he got into the, so he became a full-fledged uh, designer, uh, not looking back at the uh, good old or bad old days of uh, engineering, however you want to view it. Uh, so he has both the perspectives, perspective of being a developer or a hardcore engineer, and then as well as being a designer. So we, I think it is a privilege for us to have him on this, uh, on this for this event because he, since most of us are developers who don't understand design very well and want to learn more about design, uh, probably he can guide us uh, with his uh, diverse experience. So with that, uh, Bhupati, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Arvind. That was very uh, comprehensive uh, introduction. Yes. Um, so I'll start uh, with the subject. Um, I think Arvind has very clearly introduced me. And uh, Arvind, can you see the screen? Uh, can you guys see the Yes, uh, I can see the screen plus your video. So both are fine. Plus, plus video. Okay, fine. Uh, so yes, uh, I'm a graphic designer and uh, you can cut my box in Behance. And I also make comics. Um, <clears throat> But today's, uh, let me jump to the today's topic of uh, introducing UX design. <coughs> this is the painting of, uh, uh, can you guys see the artwork? Arvind? No, now I am seeing the Chrome window, your page. Oh, I think I should uh, share the other screen. I was seeing the wordpress.com, your page. Yeah, WordPress. yeah, so, yeah, now you should be able to see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let me start the lecture on UX uh, introduction. And uh, so I want to begin with this painting. And this is a Renaissance painting by Rembrandt uh, of a biblical story. So uh, in this story, there is a father and two sons. And uh, the elder son and the younger son, the elder son stays with the father and the younger son is little unhappy with the, uh, you know, the landscape or the place that they were living or with the family that he leaves. Um, he leaves, he takes his part of the wealth from the family, that is his inheritance. He takes that and with him he travels the world and he loses, I mean, he kinds of has fun and but then he exhausts himself and then uh, he realizes at a point that he is completely exhausted and then he wants to come back. So this, this painting is called The Return of the Prodigal Son. It's based on a biblical uh, story which Jesus tells um, to his followers. And I find this as a very good representation of what is happening uh, to digital technology in, in the sense that um, Technology is now, uh, it began with the purpose of little bit of eliminating the human error and uh, then it is now returning back uh, to appreciate the qualities of humanness uh, because humans have both the qualities of you know, a merit and demerit. Uh, so, uh, so I find this painting as a very good uh, um, representation of what uh, I'm going to uh, you know, introduce you guys or the perspective I have on UX design. Yes. 
so digital world uh, you know, first try to be better than the real world now it tries to see the you know best part of the real world or the real people um, so it, and i want to take you to why i had this opinion that why i had this opinion is it is little bit related to arvind also that uh, it's a company that i was working and uh, we had a very interesting boss and every conversation i had with this boss um uh, when i was a developer uh, was very very revealing actually it was in my final years of being a software developer and i've just taken over the job of uh, developing a module to test the module and i have to uh, write test cases for it and then uh, also verify it so the very first job i got is to create the uh, test cases and also a uh, verify it so the in, in the first conversation with my boss he was asking uh, have you finished the test cases and i said yes i have finished the test cases um no uh, how will you verify that how will you verify the module is working properly and i said i'll run the test cases i'll check the log um, then he asked me a very interesting question then how will i know that you check the log correctly <laughs> then i started laughing that no it's a trust factor that uh, because we develop a module software module and then we write our test cases to test the module that we have created then if somebody then we have to run it and see the logs and if we make a mistake in you know seeing the logs and you know so we have to write a code to again to verify the logs so it kind of became very uh, you know uh, so then he spilled a very important dialogue he said that anything human is error prone and after 4 years of education and then 7 years or nearly 6 years of being a developer then i realized what uh, the entire uh, purpose of uh, you know uh, of my job is to eliminate the human quotient uh, uh, not completely but there is a error uh, quotient Com- when when you uh, no when there is a manual a participation there is a error quotient and we are trying to eliminate it <coughs> so that this popular uh, proverb of two years is human it came to my mind and uh, so technology or digital technology or digital interfaces were initially trying to eliminate this uh, human error or the realities issues of reality the demerits of uh, reality that you can't get things done very quickly or there are errors and so there was uh, this idea of reaching a ideal world or a perfect world or a better world uh, that technology was trying to achieve that to take us to a better space by eliminating the issues of the merits of the real world or the real people from there now there is a change in this uh, behavior Uh, that now technology is trying to you know acquire uh, some qualities of real world and some qualities of real people uh, now these are there are merits if you to uh, you know uh, the technology is trying to eliminate the human part now there is there is goodness in humans and then and goodness in the reality that uh, you know that is pleasing to us and we are trying to acquire it uh, through ux design and other other humanist uh, um, humanist activities uh, of technology so there is that data, data humanism also even in big data there is a philosophy now called data humanism so humanism is now uh, happening in in terms of technology now how do you understand experience why can't it be called ux the ui so it used to be called ui when we were doing websites a decade ago we were talking about usability ease of use uh, now reducing the task of the one all that so we were talking about uh, how to make things comfortable easy and so from there we have what is this new word that we are calling user experience instead of user interface we are calling this new term user uh, experience 
So why do we need uh, to add an experience? Why are we trying to add an experience? In uh, uh, when all we need is function. All we need to do with the technology is what function or service it can provide to us. Uh, again, again, uh, if you can bear with me, I have another story to tell. Um, the, the, the reason why I have started this lecture with a lot of stories is experience is ultimately a story. And so I have decided to bore you guys with stories. <laughs> uh, so the next story is about um, us being bachelors in Bangalore and all all these guys uh, hang out in their apartment in the evening they just talk and we were telling each other the stories of uh, you know uh, or tragedies or comedies of their love um, almost there were some seven eight guys they were sharing their stories that you know, what happened in their uh, you know teenage or you know, which girl they fell in love and then how it failed or succeeded all the stories so nearly some eight guys were there everybody was telling their stories and then there was this one guy who couldn't share his story because he had no love stories there's nothing <laughs> solid to share with us so he felt left out and uh, he's um, so that uh, so he said i am going to start uh, you know finding a girl or something then everybody started advising don't you know it's a trouble don't go after a girl and then don't invite trouble your life is peaceful now then he, then he started saying, you know, this this very popular dialogue. We, we even tease him today for that, uh, you know, the dialogue he said. And uh, give me the trouble. He said, he said, love is a trouble. Don't go after him. And he said, give me the trouble. I want it. Right. So, uh, so, so after a point, uh, you know, humans need drama and uh, you know experiences. You know, we uh, so. From the time the technology or web design or any digital design is trying to uh, not discomfort or eliminate the issues of usages to make things more usable, friendly, we have moved to creating sweet troubles. Experience design is actually not about ease of use, rather the opposite of creating some drama creating memorable dramas or which can leave good impressions or the impressions that we want. Uh, so uh, without these experiences, life becomes little meaningless, you know, like the friend who said that, give me the term. So ultimately, we all need some experiences. So drama as an essential or uh, I, I would rather mix these words drama or story or experience because experience is a very short story. A short drama that happens. Uh, so, we have a big shift from ease of use, usability to uh, creating little discomforts, the discomfort that we love to have. You know, that uh, what Robert Frost talks about the low road less taken. So, the best, uh, the, you know, the first step I would say. Uh, towards this experience design. Yes, a very popular example will be Google Doodle. Uh, remember the time we had no doodles in Google and then there was Doodle, right? So uh, probably we could, uh, technology also improved to, uh, to the images can load fast that we can afford to have doodles. Uh, but having a doodle in a landing page or a friend page you know, it, it starts creating experience. You know, functionally, it is not needed, but uh, it is nice to have. And I would equate the situation to in a South Indian house or uh, you know, uh, in an Indian house, if you enter, uh, especially in rural places, there is a very elaborate design patterns used uh, with, you know, made with rice called column. So these columns were made in front of the house of uh, any uh, most Indian houses, um, especially during uh, certain occasions to express joyous mood. But if you research well, then, then these are made with rice uh, powders, which will feed the ants and keep the ants away from the house uh, during the occasions. Because during the occasion, you are going to cook something sweet 
So column is column is not just about the function, the original function. People have forgotten the original function because now people have columns in uh, plastics also, like, like stickers. Uh, originally, it was done in rice powder or something to keep the answer away. And now it satisfies many purposes, many layers of uh, needs. Um, the, but the fundamental thing is it humanizes a space and it welcomes and make, uh, you know, it adds certain uh, experience to the viewer, the neighbors, visitors, and it also allows the inmates, the people who does this column in the early morning, they feel better, they can express, they can even make an elaborate column or make a very short column. If the mood is not good, you can see a very short column or no column. And if you have a very good, uh, joyous mood in the inmates, then they will have an elaborate column. So it is also expressive. It works both for the people who create it and people who view it. And also in the non-human space where you satisfy ants. You know, environmentally also, it is a very good uh, uh, you know, solution, I would say. But it is an evolved thing. It is not something which is created by one person, but there's a cultural, uh, culturally evolved uh, behavior. And But it is, it is a desire and what I would like to introduce here is the word stakeholders. A column as a design has many stakeholders. So it helps the person it, because it is expressive. So if you see women now, uh, you know, uh, now people are complaining that people are on Instagram. But if you see that people have always created images every day, that is column actually. Every day Indian women get serpent as a column. It is not just the women thing, male can also do, but traditionally it is done by women. So a column through column, a woman has always made images every day. And so that you can so it is nothing new uh, when uh, you know people do Instagrams and make images every day. Um, yeah. So so it works for the people who create and it, it also welcomes the visitor. Um, so at human layer, we have these stakeholders and then we have ants. Primarily, it is done for ants to keep it away. And it is a beautiful uh, design which satisfies many stakeholders. So, so design is not just uh, doing what is required. It is also uh, about... Um, you know, Vineet has a question. Do you want to take yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bhupati, it's a nice uh, example, but I'm just curious. I mean, would you consider ants as a stakeholder here or as a, yes, yes. let's say, um, because it's kind of meant to repel them is what I would think, right? Uh, uh, because you're feeding, uh, yeah, because uh, I suspect that we, we started with uh, ant as the main uh, view. I mean, it is done for ants, I think. Then gradually it we have lost the meaning that uh, because in apartments we don't have much hands or something but if you imagine that you know when we were uh, we were almost rural spaces you can imagine the amount of hands that is going to enter your house uh, so column is made of rice and it keeps answer so it's i think it is one of the primary stakeholders uh, so you can you can look at the research done on column actually uh, but uh, yeah do you want to contest that Minute. Any comments on that minute? Okay. Okay, I'll just move it. So we need can come back and but I, I do think that ants are very important stakeholders. Just to corroborate my view and then make you all more believe in design being uh, not catering to the primary stakeholders that you can increase like uh, there is this issue of migrant birds getting hit in uh, glass skyscrapers in Canada. Uh, Canada has huge uh, skyscrapers built in glass and whenever the migrant birds uh, travel from one place to another or move heads north or you no, know, they get hit in the uh, glass mistaking it for the sky and <clears throat> And the huge deaths uh, every year. 
but the architects realized that uh, just converting the glass patterns from the plane uh, uh, without no patterns if you just introduce patterns in this glass that birds will be able to understand that uh, understand it is a glass and then 99% of the death was averted when they uh, change these patterns of the glass. Uh, so uh, I am talking about the contemporary concerns of the world in terms of design. Design now has to consider nature as stakeholder. So uh, this is something which is a uh, contemporary concern. I just want to introduce you guys to that. So let me come to, uh, to the very basic of designing an experience. Uh, so can you guys all see this uh, two shapes in the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, one of these shapes uh, let's consider these are alphabets of uh, you know, uh, aliens, people who live in Mars. Assume that there was a, a community in Mars and they had alphabets and these are their uh, no, two of their alphabets. Um, one of his one of his is called Boba and another is Kiki. Which one do you think is Kiki and which one you think is Boba? How many of you think that left one is Boba? And how many of you think left one is Kiki? Can I have a shout for uh, or answers from people for listening? You can ask that again. Yeah. Uh, just want to know how many of you think how many of you think that alphabet on the left is Boba? Okay. And how many of you think the uh, alphabet on the left is Kiki? Yeah, Kiki. I would say Kiki. Okay. Right. So, um, so I can't really see the responses here. So, uh, I mean, how many people are there? Yeah. Even I, even I think it's Kiki on the left side, which is which, which looks like K. Yeah. So, uh, which looks like K. Yes, that's 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 the reason you chose the left as Kiki. Right. Yeah. So because can you guys? Got... Yeah. Anybody thinks the left one is Boba and not Kiki? Right. Uh, so there is there is silence. I'll take the silence as no. Uh, yeah. So the people who chose the left one as Kiki, could you explain why did you choose that left one is Kiki, not Boba? Um, mostly, like um, I see a means the star like pattern yeah uh, it resembles k uh, yeah. at some time and you are talking about kiki or something because uh, both of these shapes they don't uh, exactly uh, tell what they are yeah frankly to speak when uh, you, you haven't introduced them or we did not name them yes uh, there is no name we since everybody understands a language of english or whatever their mother tongue is and yeah. it doesn't uh, show it, these al alphabets are not there but yeah. just my brain is drawing a pattern like we see some face in sky or something like that no and we resemble this is an elephant or something like that right so no so the right one it looks like boba which is a soft sound right yeah. and kiki kiki is a very sharp sound and you you your mind has uh, mapped the sharp sound to the sharp image and the soft sound to the soft image. Yeah, that's how I saw it actually. I mean, the sharp edges made me look think of it that way. Exactly. What yeah. So this is a this is a very popular phenomenon called synesthesia. And uh, uh, Vileno Ramachandran he has written a book uh, on and he has spoken about it in TED also. You can listen to his talk. Uh, this phenomenon of um, mapping one sense to another sense is inherently there in human uh, in human uh, inside human so even if we see a shape we hear a noise uh, so this this happens very uh, you know, subconsciously or not in the conscious layer uh, and this this is this is the quality of a creative person and then almost all of us all humans are almost creative of 
dig, uh, various degrees. Uh, there is a various degrees of synesthesia. Uh, and this phenomenon in synesthesia helps us map one sense to another sense. Uh, so this, this, is, this is why we call people creative. And you see creative people always have metaphors. And they say um, very rarely people don't accept this mapping. And, uh, you know, and we can say they are uh, they have less uh, quotient of synesthesia, but everybody has this quotient of synesthesia. So uh, if somebody says that somebody is not creative, we have to really suspect it. Almost all of us has this uh, synesthesia of mapping one sense to another sense. Um, yeah, and this going to this is going to come very handy in designing, uh, you know, uh, or choosing typefaces or to work at visual layer and make decisions on visual layer. Um, yeah. Right. So this is what I spoke about. The key, this effect is called Kiki Boba effect, and this and uh, this capacity to connect one uh, one sense to another sense is called synesthesia. Uh, so choosing a typeface. When you choose a typeface or when you create shapes in your uh, icons, in your uh, components, you know, when you're designing a uh, uh, screen, uh, no, any shapes that you create is going to create certain uh, subconscious uh, sounds. Um, any visual is also a noise. Uh, any visual, so you can make it a noise or you can make it a music. And you can make a different kind of music, but changing the rhythm of the uh, visuals. Uh, there is a underlying rhythm to visuals, just like music. Uh, so when you are designing, actually you have the, you are just like a music composer, but you have the capacity to create compositions, just like musical compositions, you are creating visual compositions. Uh, <coughs> and these effects, or not in the literal layer. What we write is evident to the reader. When they know the language, they can understand it. But the how it is written, how it is written, what typeface you have chosen, what shapes you have used, what colors you have used, all these are going to talk in a sub unspoken layer or subconscious, right? And so it is very important for a designer to understand human mind. Um, so we can equate uh, a typeface as the tone of communication. So there is always unspoken need of your stakeholders. Stakeholders, when you are designing, when you are developing some code or any software, there is a spoken agreement between the clients and us, and then people who are going to use it. There is a spoken layer of the you know, agreements and uh, requirements and uh, specifications. But there is an unspoken layer uh, which are not clearly expressed, expressed by your stakeholders. But more you know human mind and culture and all the components, uh, we can understand what happens in these layers and we can control it for our you know, benefit that we can make good impressions. Uh, so this unspoken layer is mostly humanities. Humanities in this, that's, you know, the subjects, uh, you know, BA, when people do BA humanities, anthropology, um, you know, uh, fine arts, psychology, um, you know, such uh, such topics which deals with human culture, human mind, and thing. Um, <coughs> so I, I think I'll, I've told too many stories. I, uh, I'll skip the stories that I wanted to tell. But if you if you read any writers, any good writers, you can see them capturing the unspoken layer. You know how the expressions are. People say things, people speak something when they, they are thinking something else, you know, uh, the unspoken layers and how it comes out in through the expressions. Uh, you can read Chekhov and Ashok Mitran or any good writers have explored these layers. Uh, so a good UX designer have to have a good component of humanities. He has to familiarize himself with a lot of literature uh, or uh, you know, study of human mind, any psychology book or no, he has to start familiarizing himself with human mind and the culture. Right. The, this is about color. You know? 
one thing is typefaces, another thing is typefaces or shapes that we create, a graphical component. So we saw how the graphic works, and graphic, no unspoken. And what about the color? Right? How do we choose color? We all have a good sense of color. We have developed it over. If you can dress well to a party, if you can dress well to a marriage, if you can dress well to you know, convocation, if you can dress well for an interview, you know, we are always uh, uh, gaining this uh, color sets. Now, if you can do that, you can very well design your interface also. Uh, only thing is you have to apply it. But there is a problem because in the real world, the, the, the colors are not directly hitting your eyes. Colors are reflected colors. But in, in digital, uh, the color is not reflected. Color directly originates from the screen source onto your eyes. So there is a difference between reality, how the color interacts and works uh, in reality, in the real world, and how it works in the digital world. So that is the only difference. But the taste that you have occurred in real world, you can apply it in the... Uh, so. If you, if you, if there is an occasion and you want to project yourself as a very happy person, you can dress very uh, flamboyantly with all colorful, uh, you know, very light and uh, not uh, very happy colors. And if you want to go invisible, you can create a tone which is very earthy or which matches with your skin tone and then you can remain invisible. We all do that when you go for uh, any occasion or a party. Uh, so we inherently have color sense and you should trust your intuitions. Right. But when we can design for ourselves, it is not a big, huge problem. But when we have to design for others, then it's tricky because tastes, uh, human taste varies from each person. So each person, it varies. So what color we, I love will not be uh, appealing to another person. And what color means in one culture may not mean. Uh, it is very frowned upon to have to wear black in a you know, South Indian wedding or Indian wedding. But if you wear black in a Christian okay. wedding, you, know, you, can, you can wear black in the Christian wedding. So it, it has culture. The color uh, color has different effects or meaning uh, in different culture. Uh, and also individual, each person has different tastes. So now again, the problem is that to be a good designer, you have to start understanding human mind how I, this person likes this color and the other person likes this color and why in this cul culture this color is overused there is chennai super kings have yellow why does it have one you will see yellow being recurring color in chennai uh, very flashy colors why is chennai so bright and too many bright colors are used not that every part of chennai is very brightly colored but you will see a lot of bright colors in chennai and that has reflected even in the uh, Brand Chennai, okay. um, Chennai Super Kings. <coughs> so, so there is something which affects uh, the you know, the landscape demands certain colors and taste, and then it uh, people also acquire it. All these phenomena of how the culture, land, and people interact uh, is cultural studies, and so we have to know what is subjective. So. It is an objective truth. Most of the people are not going to choose the right one as Kiki because that is something objective. It is almost like scientific truth, but you can't really get scientific about um, you know, an individual. Individual, is, individual choice and cultural choice are very subjective. Then you have to study them more. And so now what you have to understand in design is what is the objective component and the, what is the subjective component. The subjective Components for subjective components, you have to understand the culture and understand the human mind. So, design most of the design issues, or most of it, most of the part of design is anthropology, and that means reading human mind and its culture. Right? So, designers are, have to be an anthropologist and you have to study culture. Uh, I may have a question here. Yeah, yeah. 
So you spoke about understanding culture and uh, you gave examples culture from a perspective of let's say Chennai or some other city or yeah. a nation. So that's in a geographic sense. Yeah. But let's say I am a web designer. I am designing a site for a sports. Yeah. Another site for a news channel. Another yeah. site from an education perspective. Maybe it's yeah. online education. Right. So. Uh, I, I, these are all different disciplines. Probably each of those have subcultures. So what What is your thought on that? Yes. So uh, if you go into anthropology, anthropology is not just geographically uh, uh, grouped, or uh, they don't study anthropology just based on uh, geography. Even even the generation, the, the generation now, which has grown up digitally, is a different different demography. So it is also time. It is not also just space. It is also time. Even time, time can even age can divide uh, the so culture of uh, youngsters. Uh, what is happening right now is that every two year you have a generation gap because people are using different apps. Uh, people uh, five years before people didn't know uh, that my students who were five years before were not using this uh, app called Discord. Now the students now are. Uh, using discord so the discord generation has a different culture compared to the previous culture so uh, anthropology is not ge necessarily geographical uh, so it, it it just tries to understand the behavioral change between group of people and what is the component the geography is one will be one component uh, but there will be other components also like uh, you know the time and uh, yeah also the tools that are available to us. Yeah, I mean, did I answer that question? Yeah, thank you. So anthropology, you can study, uh, you can go and look at anthropological, so the socio, uh, you know, social anthropology, many, many other things. Are. But, but uh, designers should be curious about this. You have to acquire some basics of anthropology and to understand and understand. So when you are Arvind, we are saying you are designing for sports. You have to know. Uh, I'm going to talk about it. The problem is that you can't see if you have really had a sports store, right? If you really had a sports store, you will know who is coming to your store, right? You will daily see, get to see your audience, and who is coming to store. You can you can read them uh, in the real world. In the digital world. Um, Right now we have big data and heuristics, but still we are making a lot of assumptions of who is coming to it, why they are coming to it. And we have less data compared to the real world. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you have to know your audience. So th this is something that uh, uh, so that happens in our family also that when we go to buy a vegetable every day I have to go and buy vegetable when I was in my hometown and and all I want is the list of vegetables right so if you're asked to go for the daily errands of uh, groceries uh, all you need is the list of vegetables but whenever I go my mother keeps talking about everything uh, she starts because she starts speaking her mind so she starts telling me what she cooked yesterday and what is left in the fridge and what uh, you know what in this season what should be good and she will also start talking about the grocery people like the, the, because they are very close to us and what is happening in the family of the grocery store man and i really used to hate it because um, it it doesn't make sense to me so i was asking her just give me the list why but later i have realized that knowing all this i can um, if she is going to give me a list of vegetables, if one is not there, you know, how will I choose if there is no that the vegetable is not there? So she is trying to give me the big data, but I'm trying to avoid it. And uh, but if I have the data that I can choose it well actually, but I'm trying to avoid the understanding or delegate the understanding. Um, and she is also trying to create make me more human towards the grocery store. Because if you have a better relation with the grocery store, you will probably get the best vegetables. So you should know what is happening to the father of the grocery man. You know, he has had a heart attack. And then if you inquire, if you have created a relation, you will probably have, not because you have to get a good grocery uh, from them, 
but it is always good to have um, uh, you know good uh, vegetables and then good relation also so uh, more we know about our space or where we interact we can actually have better uh, you know better life or better outputs we follow such uh, so again uh, when you are designing um, a website it it goes from one screen to another screen so it is not just about designing one screen it is also about taking the viewer or the people uh, you know your audience from one screen to another like it is about how to arrange a particular event that there are people who throw very interesting parties and they decide on the menu uh, it's a nice menu how can you decide on a good menu and good party how can you connect if you don't know the people right so you can conduct a very good party uh, evening party that only if you know the visitors so the, the idea is that ux design problem with the ux design is that that it is you are asked to do a party without knowing the faces right and when you know the faces who is going to come and their preferences then you can have a very good party you know very good ux design right <clears throat> so so again the knowing these people is nothing but humanities you know it's it's theater it's fine arts all that storytelling all that that humanities give uh, education of humanities give to us is what is required for ux designer so ux designer has to know uh, a very good he has to know very good storytelling he should have a very good storytelling capacities because storytelling is you know the sequential uh, art of sequencing art actually um, uh, you take from one screen to another and then structuring the uh, structuring the sequence of images um, now in order to prove my point i have to point out that the most important designers of google who came up with this material design you know john lilly and he is a graduate of theater actually he did ba theater uh, that mean uh, who you know who is educated to drama uh, so he is the founder of material design actually so then he learned web design and then he grew he became a ux designer another important person in material design matthias dore he he is actually an engineer but in his college he was running the art gallery so i would see if if i have to pick two disciplines from humanities which are essential for ux design i would say it is fine art and uh, fine art and storytelling which is narrative or the, you can say playwright or a script writing any storytelling skill set and in fine art because design is nothing but applied arts i would say or applied humanities um, right so hey, you, you can divide ux design into screens and uh, you have to design one screen and you have to design how it transitions from one screen to another which makes it very similar to film making or you know play right so there is a so you are worried about how to structure one screen how to structure within the screen and how to structure create structures across the screen which screen should come first and which screen should come so which is which scene should come first and which screen, which is a, this is the problem of a playwright or a script writer you now which scene is a because story if you see there are many versions of mahabharat or godfather uh, godfather has been adapted many uh, in many culture and even in india godfather has uh, godfather has been adapted many times but how to sequence it right which which part should come first and which which scene should come later is a headache of a script writer and um, so i would say you can divide it as divide the ux design as a uh, structuring within the screen and structuring across a screen so structuring within a screen is a artist job or a fine artist job and structuring across the screens is a playwright's challenge so uh, so you can look at um, mark rothko jackson pollock uh, fine artists like that they are abstract artist because they are not dealing with realism uh, so if you take all our graphical components in ux designs they are very abstract forms and can you create uh, harmony can you create uh, can you create rhythm like polak or vasily kandinsky 
there are many art movements which try to work with unreal, non-representative art or art which is abstract, not depicting things in reality, but you know, um, like vector shapes. Okay. If you see Rothko, all his art is very vector, uh, but he is trying to play with that, actually, trying to arrange or structure it or compose it and create harmony. And that is what we do in UX, uh, UX design. And again, how this screen should move, how the journey of a user should happen, um, you know, user journey or and the task flow. Now, the task flow is a decade back. Now we call it user journey. How the journey of a user is an immersive expression. And it is the same problem a scriptwriter or a playwright uh, has to. How do I construct this play? Many plays of Mahabharata or any classical stories have been Shaguntala. All this has been done again and again. Right? You can you can you can read uh, Indian narrative writers who have deconstructed the plays of classical writers like Kalidasa, Kumbar, and very contemporary playwright Mahesh Dattan. He is he's wonderful, and you can see, if you are in Bangalore, you can go and see his plays in Rangasandra. Uh, so it is very essential to acquire these. Uh, tastes of playwrights and artists uh, to become a better UX designer. It will be taught if you are, if you go to a proper uh, courses, they will teach you narrative and they will teach you compositions, uh, composition which is the primary task of an artist and then how to uh, script or narrate. So this is this is a play that I saw in Bangalore in Rangasan Prats. Extraordinary non-linear play uh, done by Mahesh so, uh, so, so watch a lot of plays or even uh, you know, uh, web series which are well structured, well scripted. Plays we can help you to learn narrative, and then you can be a very good. Uh, uh, you can take the viewers in a very interesting way through your apps and digital. Interviews. So. Structure across. Structure across is how do I sequence my screens uh, you know, to create an experience. As I said, experience is a story. So that makes that every story has three parts, starting, middle and end, and not necessarily in the same order. This is a very popular saying about narrative. And narrative has three parts, you know, establishment, conflict and resolution, but not necessarily in the same order. So you can you can read uh, uh, narrative theories, uh, you know, theories here like A. K. Ramanujan, um, you know, from the from very old classical times we have Aristotle who tried to you know see the structure of any story. He just divided very primitively. He decided two kind of structure, which is comedy and tragedy. Now we have much more uh, uh, you know, uh, developed analysis of uh, narratives. And for, to understand Indian narratives, you can read a Karamurthy man. I think you can apply him uh, for any international. So, a very beautiful uh, narrative dedication. So, uh, now, so I think we have to gain this narrative capability to do structure across the screens. But what to do? For to structure within the screen, within the screen, how to create good structures and beautiful structures, right? And why we don't try to do it, or why people have not really had to do it, is probably they didn't think of the screen as an artwork. We always thought a screen is to do a job, rather than uh, you know uh, looking at it as an artwork. So after we finish the functionality, or while doing the functionality and creating the screens. We can start, we can change our attitude towards a screen and start imagining it as a canvas or artwork. And then we will start creating artwork. So then just like why should our curtains in the home, you know, people take a lot of effort to decide a curtain in a, in a space uh, or decide the furniture. But a decade back, we didn't, we didn't really care much how a screen looked. Uh, because we didn't treat it as an artwork. So, uh, look at it as an artwork, then we will have 
uh, you know, you will worry about how to compose it. And this is this is Mark Rocco. And you can look at his paintings. Uh, this is not his painting, but it is a painting about him. This is Rothko in standing uh, in front of his painting. And if you look at his paintings, are very simple, basic frames, just like how our panels in a web page will be. But he tried to create harmony within that. So he's an abstract artist. So, so this is a little bit introduction that art. Uh, Art was divided primarily as a representative art, which is realism, art which exactly depicts what is there in the world, and then art which is abstract. And why we have to know these differences? This abstract art or non representative art is what is going to help in UX design. If you look at, I would recommend you all start looking at abstract artists. You can go to the galleries in your place and start familiarizing with abstract art movement. An expressionist art movement. Sometimes there is club and abstract expressionism is there, right? Uh, in, because so we were always looking at realistic art. We we were actually not believing in abstract art, but abstract art is what is going to help us to design and compose a screen. You know, how the frame should be. We are because constantly using symbolic shapes, abstract shapes, and we are trying to. Create harmony with it. So we need the quality and the taste of an abstract artist, a skill set of an abstract artist or an expressionist artist to create very pleasing screens, right? And herein there is there is this element of we designing these compositions. But in art there is something called Dadaism where you know. They don't control the composition. They just accept the compositions of the nature. And uh, Dadaists are, uh, are people who totally um, uh, got fed up with the art world during the World War II. That entire education of art didn't help to achieve peace during the World War. So they just surrendered to the fate and chance. So I will not compose my. Uh, you know, compose my graphical comp. I'll just throw this is the art done by you know uh, one of the Dadais, where he just threw the through the uh, paper you know, paper cutouts and he just accepted it. He didn't try to change it. So there, he didn't try to compose it. And so there is many kinds of many philosophies in design that you can familiarize yourself with. The best thing is to go to start going to galleries. I start reading about uh, these abstract painters, exhibition art, from different art movements. Right. So then we all know Picasso. Uh, what some people may not know that he was the best realist during his teenage. Even in his teenage, he has achieved the realism that he can paint like a Renaissance painter when he was around 20. From there, he got shocked when he saw African masks and you know. Uh, on an artwork from different cultures, uh, which are traditionally considered as tribals, and he couldn't understand how these shapes, which are not realistic, are accepted by the people, and he 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 gradually gave up his realism and started becoming abstract, and he he will become uh, started making paintings much like tribals, and then he called it neo tribalism, and. Um, he in the end he started making uh, toys because you know the experience of seeing a painting is just one sense but experience of a toy is tangible you can touch it you know you can see it touch it and play with it so it is very interactive so Picasso as an artist he wanted to become an experience designer a toy is an experience actually. So he started designing toys for his kids at his very old age. He had actually had several marriages, so he had kids at his very old age, and he started designing toys. So experience design is not just restricted to art, and it can move beyond. Uh, uh, you know, it can move to multi-sensory uh, tasks, and then um, it, it 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 realized uh, the beauty is Picasso realized what is art. In the end that it is not about the how real you can depict rather what joy it can bring to people a very unrealistic toy can bring a lot of joy to a kid and what does that mean that 
it means we don't need the best composition. We can just bring joy once we understand what is joy, you know, what is the purpose of art, right? Uh, so, design is an anthropological act. You know? Once you understand, it's a cultural act. And then you have to bring joy to the people. Right, so, how do I learn? How do I learn these subjects of humanities, fine art? Uh, you know? um, so, start, start consuming art in the sense Satyajitre didn't go to a film school. Satyajitre saw in, in a stretch of six months, within six months, he saw 60 films in, in UK. And he had no education on filmmaking, but he was a good graphic designer. Though. But he just saw 60 films in them. So he had a course of art, a film appreciation. With six months of film appreciation happened to him because he just watched films. And he he was charged up to make films. So, uh, so if you want to be, if you want to learn, uh, no, if you want to get familiarized with fine art or uh, storytelling, all you have to read is good literature, good see, see good paintings, and start familiarizing with all this. Um, so I, my recommendation is, if you're in Bangalore, go to the Ranga Sankara and see a lot of plays. Uh, go to Blossoms and read nice literature, poetry, novels, short stories. And watch uh, OTT web series in Prime or Netflix. And go to galleries. Uh, this may sound very ridiculous, but being a good experienced designer you know, can be only. Uh, you cannot avoid these actually. You have to be good at every other human uh, you know, uh, engagement uh, to be good in uh, UX design actually. And. And how do they do it? How do these people, artists, uh, how did they create good palette, good composition? Is they borrow it, the, they borrow from nature. They study what are all the patterns and compositions that exist in nature. Human mind uh, appreciates you know, uh, what it sees around actually. So what we are already familiar, familiar compositions and color palettes and color harmony that exists in nature, when it is depicted in uh, through painting, we you know we become more joyous. So um, if you if you go and see how artists were trained, they were trained to make color choices, but looking at the nature's palette, how nature's have uh, different colors combinations in birds, in leaves or trees, how how the nature creates. Is we study nature and then we create all. So all these writers, even the writers, they study life. How if you if you look at Chekhov's short stories, they are very very radical. They say he was jotting down his life happenings. It was like very similar to David. So he was studying life. How life throws things at you, surprise you when you are expecting a tragedy, comedy happens. When you are expecting a comedy, tragedy happens life surprises you and then when you know the structure of structure how life scripts your life right uh, or how nature or fate scripts your life and that is what is reflected in writers so um, so this this is a text from a fifth century art writer uh, so where he says that uh, all masters are created by from, you know all masters are borrowed from nature and you will achieve perfection you know, uh, by studying nature and applying it. Now, now this is once you once you have created, then how you cannot leave it like that. You have to get feedback. You know, if you have created any screens or any interactions, you have to test it. And even great artists have tested. It. They have made painting to, to better their painting in the next painting. This Greek artist Apelles, he has hid behind his painting. Whenever his painting was exhibited, he will go and hide it, hide behind his painting, and will listen to the people, what is their, uh, what what they are discussing about his painting. So feedback is very essential for design to evolve. So uh, it is it is not that you design and you leave it. It is going to in a, um, through agile way. So we call it agile process that you create and then you test it and then you redesign it so and this is a very volume and it's a never ending process 
or this is this is the final uh, final page or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so apart from this, that what I want to end it with is that uh, once we have and humanized the technology, then um, there are other concerns also. Right? So, so there was a point that Martin Heidegger is a German philosopher. He talks about what is happening with the technology. He was not there when UX design. So he will be very happy during the time uh, now actually. He, to see UX design, he will be very happy because we are trying to humanize the technology. So he is the one who identified that technology is becoming dehumanizing um, around the industrial era. Because during the industrial era, he points out that until before industrialization, people see natural resources as, uh, as a soulful thing. Then after the industrialization, people have started looking at natural resources or beings. He calls beings have become non-beings. Uh, in, 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 in a way that we start looking at river as you know how many megawatts it can energy that it can give. So we can we have started quantifying the uh, you know living things, uh, you know na natural bodies. Uh, so this 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 has happened after the industrialization. So he points out this. He said that people have started thinking in numbers, and beings have become non beings, and non beings have become beings. So I want to point out that uh, Tamil grammar, uh, the 2000 or 3000 3, year old Tamil grammar, it's a language grammar, has three chapters. First chapter, or first section is about, you know, uh, the text and next about the speech. The third section is about how to live. In the grammar, you will never see this grammar, uh, third chapter in any any language grammar. Yeah, so. It is written by Tolkapia and it's called Tolkapia because language is a technology and the, the person who wrote it was very worried that how this language as a technology will be used by people and he was trying to give you know, how to live, um, the way to live also. So uh, as we are designing, uh, designing digital interactions, we also have to consider uh, you know, other aspects, ethics, and you know, uh, environmental issues. Uh, so, so design is evolving to take care of these things also. Uh, that's why I said the nature as a stakeholder is an important thing. In uh, so, when we are creating stakeholders map for uh, experience design, we should include nature. We should include things that, you know, just like how Colum started addressing to many, you know, not non-primary stakeholders. We have to include every stakeholders that is possible and yeah and uh, there I end my talk and if you have any questions you can ask. Thank you Bhupati for that uh, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, any questions from others first? Anyone uh, beneath uh, Naveen, Deepti, or Sandeep? Okay. Uh, this is Sandeep here. Uh, Bhupati, yeah. it, it, it's really very good uh, that today I have attended. It's the first tech uh, talk session after a long time, and uh, it was very good. And whatever you have told, I made a notes of that. It's extremely interesting. Uh, especially the way you have told about uh, uh, user experience, like uh, why it is very important, and till ending, like uh, what all we, what uh, a typical good user experience designer, that is UX designer, should be looking for, where the, he should look at the designs and other things. It was excellent. Uh, you can ask me any questions if you have for anybody. One question I have is uh, related yeah. to the role of data in yeah. UX design. So I remember long back, uh, maybe this is uh, anecdote, maybe 10 year old anecdote, where I think it is in Google, uh, the logo was a logo or a button was designed in a certain blue color or shade of blue. 
but an alternative shade of blue was also put out so they did some sort of a ab testing okay and the alternative which was not such an appealing color to the original designer that had better conversions so then google went with that alternative design yeah. so the question is uh, what is the role of data how important is the role of data and uh, do we often find this case where data overrides the choice of the designer uh so that that depends on your research methods actually so how good is your data is depends on your data um, the acquiring method or research methodology um i there is this new uh, new uh, what you call discipline called data humanism actually. so where this entire uh, entire trust on data is little challenged and a uh, very simple example will be if data is sufficient why we have to have a commentary in a cricket article every day we have a cricket article or sports article and we have score cards right uh, that should be enough why are we having a passage of text besides it right so a narrative narrative can really take you through the experience and uh, data is always insufficient and that is why it is data because it is sampled and uh, yeah so a narrative actually narrative a well done narrative actually um, so data as a narrative is something that we have another question i have is uh, are we uh, let's say ux designer is he uh, somewhat restricted by technology that surrounds him so to give you context why i am asking this uh, devopedia we have a website you might have seen it devopedia.org yeah and in the beginning we had a certain design for the article page yeah so the design was a little had a little bit of animation and it had some uh, bright colors kind of thing yeah. and it had that wow factor because when right. people first saw that animation and the colors color schemes they were impressed by that right. but then you know the performance was not that great because the animations took a little time and right. not everybody was pleased by the colors there were always always some people who didn't like those colors right and because the animation is slower the you know google does uh, sir, ranking so uh, for google search results uh, you know the performance is also one of the criteria right so google gives it gives a tool for developers to test the performance of each site and how it ranks in yeah. the search results right. so there we were performing uh, poorly yeah. so because of these constraining uh, requirements from technology perspective we were forced yeah. to kind of simplify the design we removed the animation we reduced the color scheme to something very yeah. subtle so now so, we have a highly performance site but it lacks that wow factor uh so there is this primary and secondary data so and then qualitative and quantitative data maybe maybe so you have to balance all this that uh, quantitative data is not enough that qualitative data so you can have interviews of the people who is coming to your sites so uh, so you can pick these people who actually problem with digital design as i said is that we don't know who is who is entering our store you no know? a website you can imagine it as your office and if you had a real office that you will know the reactions of the people who is walking in you know who is walking in it. so you have a very good understanding when you have a real office but if it is a digital office right um it is difficult to know what is the reactions and you google is giving you some data but is half data is always misleading so it is better better you have interviews of people you can really talk to people who is using the site and you know have conversation with them and then find out action and the first step will be make it work for you if you like it and you know if you have a good representative that you can one of your team member can be a very good representative for your you know he can represent your so if it satisfy that person or yourself it is going to work for everybody uh, that is one thing uh, so another thing is going beyond 
going beyond these uh, because design now is not really enough uh, it has to really take a leap a huge leap to um, see so that's what i'm talking about material design and all that so i quoted a material designer so you have to really know what you are designing that is another problem that what are you actually designing when you know what you are designing what experience you want to create so first you have to fix that uh, so what kind of material you are trying to create once you know that there is no stopping you then you can create achieve that and then then you can have the reaction right now in web web designs or any digital design this references is not there that what experience you want to create so you have to fix that first um, so you can look at what was what it used to be before the technology then you can borrow something like that so that's what they are saying no? but you have to start, if it is a painter i have to if i'm creating a painting i know i am painting this and i know in reality how it looks but when i am de designing something digitally we are replacing something right so we have to create the same experience which we are trying to better at and so again st studying its original reality will help us thank you yeah. it's little uh, vague <laughs> but yeah we can have, uh, yeah questions Sorry. from others so uh, hi this is not Naveen, go ahead. After that, we need. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bhupati, thanks for a very insightful session. Uh, makes us think. Uh, we as engineers tend to think in one way, you know, logically, from one step to another. So understanding humans who we are designing products for, uh, I think that's uh, uh, very. Uh, that's actually the starting point of uh, whatever we want to create. Uh, I think uh, it's it definitely gives me a lot of things to take away from the session as well. So one thing that I uh, struggle with when I um, talk to clients, when I work with uh, products is when to um, uh, have a user experience designer or when to uh, have them on board, right? And it's always a challenge on, okay, usually we uh, come up with something uh, pretty bad and then later we get a uh, ux consultant and then we realize that hey you know what uh, whatever you you know like we start reinterpreting and do a lot of rework and stuff like that so uh, yeah i wanted to hear your perspective on the ux process and how it gels with the product development uh, if, if you can afford it you can start from the starting itself but if you can't afford it, you can put your first version out. And then when you are through Agile, if you're trying to improve it, when you have hit a place where you want to better it uh, more than the functionality, when you have achieved the basic functionality, after that, if you want to move ahead, then you can bring in a UX designer if you can't afford it from the start. But if you can afford from the start itself, and uh, if then it can create a, you know, um, what you call head lead. Uh, it can give you a good start actually if if you have a UX designer from the start itself. That's it. Sure. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Vineet, you have a question? Navin, did I answer the question? Yes, yes. It, it definitely helps um, to take a perspective from, uh, from the ground. Um, and because I uh, usually, yeah, like you said, we try to balance uh, trade off some things for others, sometimes time, sometimes um, like budget. So all, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. all this is done in agile way. So you can always go ahead without UX design. But once you bring in a UX designer, it is going to make huge impact, uh, no better impact. It's supposed to actually, it's if your designer is good. It will, it will bring you more. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Bhupati. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah deeply good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the session. So my question is, uh, 
uh, whenever I do some research and whenever I give, the, whenever I submit that uh, by telling, uh, by giving the wireframes and uh, by show, showcasing them the design. So I'm not uh, that good at the communication skill to make them understand what literally that design seems to be or uh, how should I convey the client what my design is talking about and uh, as they give a document or uh, the stuff for us before uh, designing so i want to convey them uh, this is how it imp uh, like the design this is how it reacts to the user so how to convey them because of uh, i'm not uh, like convincing i don't think so but they want to understand the design i don't want to convince them so how to improve the skill uh, is my question. Uh, so the so the, they probably lack imagination and uh, that is so how are you providing this if you're providing wireframes uh, how are you providing it to them? Uh, in the Figma file I share them and okay. I, I share them even though sometimes I go forward a step forward by designing them uh, with the low fi low fi wireframes also so that would make them more uh, clear or they may get a better picture of the ui aesthetics as well right so if you are uh, so the um, i suspect the lack of imagination so if you are providing the low fidelity it may mm -hmm. not have the final final details like high fidelity so high fidelity prototypes in figma mm -hmm. when you do a high fidelity so it may be difficult to do high fidelity of all the frames, but you can do a couple of frames in high fidelity uh, and that will probably push your case more. So okay. when you are discussing with clients, you are going rough wireframes, right? Yeah. So wireframe is not a final detail one, so it will yeah. be still hard for them to appreciate what you're saying. So what you can do is um, you can make wireframes for many, but at least a couple of frames or three frames you can make it in high fidelity and say this is how it is going to work and then rest of the frames also will be in similar uh, okay yeah mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah so they have to really see how it is going to look in, in final details so we have to give them a slice of you know taste like when you go to a sweet stop they give you a part of sweet right yeah, yeah. just like that you have to give them a taste of few uh, few screens exact okay. screens uh, high fidelity screens not okay. every not all the screens but at least a couple of screens or three screens okay yeah. thank you any more questions Okay, then uh, yeah, it's almost uh, what nine. So thanks a lot, Bhupati, for that very interesting session. And definitely, it's uh, uh, very a departure from our usual boring sessions okay. that uh, show code and stuff like that. So that way, this has been very thought provoking, and a lot of references you have given. Uh, you have pointed us to different people, personalities, their works, their philosophies. So something we can go back and read about to learn more about yes. and to be a UX good UX designer, as you put it, we have to be also consuming a lot of content lot out there. Yeah, in lot of experiences. Forms. Yeah, a lot of experiences. You have to get build up our own experiences before we can create something for our users. Yeah. So with that, uh, let's take leave. Thank you, Bhubati. Thanks everyone for joining this call. Thank you, Aravind. Also, it was very nicely arranged and well introduced and uh, very important work you are doing and i'm going to more get engaged with this devopedia uh, sure sure you are welcome yeah. time to uh,